1918 set on the Western Front, the war landscape was still defined by trenches stretching hundreds of miles, as in the previous four years. During this time, Europe had been immersed in a gruesome conflict, with battles bearing casualties in the hundreds of thousands. The war had drained all the warring parties, their armies on the verge of physical and mental breakdown. A stage was set for the grand entry of the American Expeditionary Force. For the first time in their history, American soldiers were to prove their mettle on the world stage. On the battlefields of the Meuse Valley and the Argonne Forest, they would write a chapter so glorious that it would forever be etched in the annals of military history. The Meuse-Argonne Offensive, the largest and bloodiest operation of the American Expeditionary Force during World War I, was not just about showcasing American strength and valor, though. It was a turning point, a final push toward ending a war that had held the world in its grip for too long. The entry of the United States into war in 1917 was a sigh of relief for the Allies. However, with a small standing army and lacking war equipment, America wasn't ready for immediate intervention. The first batch of American soldiers, the Doughboys, that set foot on French soil, numbered only 14,000 men. It would take almost a year for this number to reach one million soldiers. Therefore, this backdrop was bleak. In addition, Russia's internal collapse and France's failed offensives added to the Allies' woes. Having capitalized on Russia's absence, the German forces launched a massive offensive in March 1918, banking on their perception of an unprepared American force. However, by late spring, the tables began to turn. The U.S. men helped repulse German advances at key locations, including Chateau Thierry and Belo Wood. On July the 4th, 1918, American volunteers embedded with seasoned British and Australian troops defeated the Germans in the Battle of Hamel, marking a significant Allied collaboration in the war. As mentioned, the American presence grew by that point, that it started to counterbalance the previous Allied losses. Come September, it resulted in the U.S. First Army securing a pivotal win in the St. Michiel region. The Americans secured their first major victory in the war. As the Germans were losing their ground in France, the Allies wanted to exploit the moment and give their enemies a blow that would bring them to their knees. For this to come true, they needed the effort of every single soldier at the front, especially the fresh and combat-ready Americans. Even before the dust from the Battle of St. Mihiel settled, the American Expeditionary Force, or AEF, was thrown into new action. Engaged in a monumental task, its commander, General John J. Pershing, regrouped hundreds of thousands of soldiers from the front line around Metz to the front line up north between the forests of Argonne and the Meuse River. Just a week later, at the onset of the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, the formidable force of the American U.S. First Army took its position. Impressive 15 divisions of the 1st, 3rd, and 5th Corps were deployed in the following order. In the Western sector was the 1st Corps, comprising the 77th, 28th, and 35th Divisions in the first line of battle and the 92nd Division in reserve. To the right of them were the 91st, 37th, and 79th Divisions of the 5th Corps, with the 32nd Division in reserve. The 3rd Corps occupied the Eastern Sector with the 4th, 80th, and 33rd Divisions in its composition and the 3rd Division in reserve. The strategic reserve of the 1st Army consisted of the 1st, 29th, and 82nd Divisions. These divisions were notably large, containing 12 battalions each, as opposed to the standard 9 battalions in the French, British, and German divisions. Such oversized divisions meant that, despite being fresh to the battlefront, they matched the strength of their allies, whose ranks had been thinned from previous combat and had been only partially replenished. Adjacent to the Americans, the French forces stood ready. Among these were the renowned 4th Army under Henri Gouraud and the 5th Army led by Henri Mathias Berthelot. In total, the Allied troops numbered around 1,200,000 men. Armored support to the AEF 
was also evident. The 35th Division was bolstered by the 1st U.S. Tank Brigade, led by George S. Patton, operating French Renault FT light tanks. Alongside them, within the 5th Corps, was the 3rd U.S. Tank Brigade, equipped with 250 French crewed tanks. Other divisions, such as the 37th and 79th, received additional armored support from French tank regiments and medium tank groups. Like tanks, a plethora of other heavy equipment from artillery pieces to aircraft was supplied mainly by the French. For the Meuse-Argonne front specifically, this translated to an impressive 2,780 artillery pieces, 380 tanks, and 840 aircraft. In the end, it is essential to note that as the battle intensified, reinforcements continually arrived. The American forces eventually swelled to 22 divisions, effectively constituting two full-field armies. At the helm of the American forces was General John Joseph Pershing. Black Jack, named after his service with African-American regiments in the American West, was no stranger to the challenges of leadership and the rigors of warfare. He served against the Apache in the Southwest, fought in the Spanish-American War, suppressed uprisings in the Philippines, and even chased down the Mexican revolutionary, Pancho Villa. His service was marked with rapid promotions, even leapfrogging 862 senior officers to achieve the rank of Brigadier General, as commissioned by President Theodore Roosevelt. When the U.S. declared war on Germany in 1917, another U.S. President, Woodrow Wilson, handpicked Pershing to lead the AEF in Europe. It was a significant transition for Pershing, having been previously engaged mainly in anti-insurgency campaigns. Nevertheless, he took on the task, envisioning an AEF force unparalleled in size and might. Pershing recommended the formation of a one-million-man army by 1918, later projecting three million by 1919. Being a good strategist, he knew that only a large American army could turn the tides of the war, with the Allies being on the verge of exhaustion. However, one thing he didn't count on was that the French and British generals had plans of their own. Once the Americans arrived in France, a debate arose about their ideas of diffusing American troops into European ranks. Pershing vehemently opposed this. For him, the integrity and independence of the American army were paramount. The heated discussions between Pershing and French Field Marshal Ferdinand Foch over this issue culminated in Pershing's open refusal to dilute the identity of the American army. Eventually, Pershing won the argument, but in return he had to relinquish his ambitions towards Metz and help the upcoming Allied offensive in the north, leading to American participation in the Meuse-Argonne offensive. Facing Pershing's reluctance to dissolve his troops, the Allies had to reshape the strategy for the offensive, giving the American forces a sector of their own. In preparing the strategy for the offensive, Pershing was led by audacity and optimism gained after the victory at St. Mihail. In his plans, Pershing envisaged overcoming the stalemate of trench warfare by a swift maneuver of his troops, relying on blunt force and the unique structure of his divisions. He believed his tactics would surprise the Germans and result in prompt capture of their key strategic points. However, in the face of a formidable German defense, this task was more than challenging. The German forces were braced for the oncoming storm even though, by the time, the might of the German divisions was not what it once was. Many had mustered only half or even less of their original strength. Notably, the 117th Division, facing the U.S. to 79th Division, had a mere 3,300 soldiers. Furthermore, morale among the Germans was inconsistent. Units transferred from the Eastern Front displayed high spirits, while those battle-worn from the Western Front showed signs of strain. Regardless, the German resistance was considerable. 450,000 troops from the 5th Army of Group Galwitz, commanded by the seasoned general George von der Marwitz. The Germans also had the advantage of defending from fortified positions, which they built in expectation of the Allied advance. In the Meuse-Argonne sector, 
throughout the battlefield punctuated by hills and woods, three key defensive lines spread, the most formidable being the Kriemhilde Stelling, part of the more extensive Hindenburg defensive network. German fortifications also dominated the heights on the Meuse's east bank, posing a significant threat to the advancing Americans. Navigating this treacherous terrain and bypassing the fortified German positions was not easy, particularly given that a mere three narrow and dilapidated roads serviced the sector. Finally, after all preparations were done, the day of the attack came on September 26, 1918. During the initial hours preceding H hour, the Allies unleashed a relentless barrage of artillery fire that dwarfed the entire four-year ammunition expenditure of the American Civil War. The staggering cost of this intense prelude to battle was later calculated at $180 million, equating to a million dollars spent every minute, an astronomical figure even by today's standards. This ferocious bombardment set the stage for the American attack, which commenced at 0530. As the American forces moved forward, a mix of outcomes marked their progress. The 50 and 3rd Corps made significant strides toward their objectives despite facing considerable challenges from German defenses. The 79th Division had difficulties capturing Montfaucon, while the 28th Division's advance was slowed considerably due to robust German resistance. The 91st Division, known as the Wild West Division, was compelled to evacuate the village of Epinonville, although it managed to advance approximately 8 kilometers. The subsequent day, September 27th, witnessed a general stagnation of the 1st Army's progress. The 79th Division eventually succeeded in capturing Montfaucon, and the 35th Division achieved gains by taking the village of Baulny, Hill 218, and Charpentry. The right flank performed admirably, advancing into the woods south of brieux sur meuse However, the extreme left encountered formidable resistance within the Argonne Forest. By September 29th, the situation on the battlefield had intensified significantly. Six additional German divisions arrived to confront the American offensive. To counter the American attacks, the Germans adopted a robust machine gun defense, bolstered by heavy artillery support, while frequently launching counterattacks with fresh troops, particularly against the 28th and 35th Divisions. The intensity of the German counterattack significantly impacted the 35th Division, composed of National Guard units from Missouri and Kansas. These troops had faced leadership changes shortly before the offensive and bore the brunt of the enemy's assault. Many other divisions suffered severe losses, especially those exposed to artillery crossfire. Amid these challenges, the critical issue was restoring communications across the treacherous no-man's land. Only four roads traversed this hazardous zone, and the intense artillery fire during prior battles had left them in shambles. Nevertheless, the tireless efforts of engineers and pioneers eventually enabled the movement of troops, artillery, and crucial supplies, facilitating the continuation of the offensive. By the end of September, a troubling stagnation gripped the First Army. The halted advancement and increasing disarray in the rear sectors signaled to General Pershing that immediate restructuring was imperative to rejuvenate the offensive. Pershing's solution was clear-cut infused the line with experienced units that had regrouped and recovered after the St. Michiel campaign. A brief tactical pause ensued in the V Corps as the battle-worn divisions stepped back, making way for the fresh 3rd and 32nd Divisions. Over in the 1st Corps, the distinguished 1st Division stepped in, relieving the 35th Division of its duties. Only the 3rd Corps' organization remained unchanged. Pershing was determined and resolute as the first phase of the battle concluded. However, it was clear his strategy of a swift maneuver and blunt force did not catch the seasoned and deeply entrenched Germans by surprise as planned. The second phase of the Meuse-Aragon offensive commenced on October 4th with an ambitious assault to break the stagnation. In a daring attempt to outwit the German forces, 
the Americans opted for an attack without the thunderous preamble of artillery. The experienced units that Pershing had infused his front lines with to regroup and resume his blunt force strategy were pushed forward to overwhelm German defenses. But the Germans were prepared. Their machine guns and side artillery turned the American advance into a grueling crawl. The savage fighting was a war of attrition on the battlefield. The burden of command. Amidst the struggling forces, the 1st Division, under the leadership of the indomitable Charles P. Summerall, pierced a seven-kilometer salient up the Air River Valley. Their courage came at an immense price. In just under a week, they lost 9,387 men, necessitating their withdrawal. At the same time, a group of around 540 soldiers from New York's 77th Division found themselves trapped in the Ravin de Cholevo in the midst of the dense Argonne Forest. With communication lines severed and no one in the command aware of their position, the lost battalion resisted German forces and even deadly friendly artillery fire for several days. Their last hope rested on a pigeon named Cherami. Despite being shot through the chest, blinded in one eye, and having a gaping hole in one wing, the pigeon successfully delivered a crucial message that halted the friendly fire. Four days after they got lost, a strategic move by Hunter Liggett involving the all-American 82nd Division rescued these beleaguered soldiers. Only 194 soldiers survived when reinforcements arrived. They attributed their salvation to Cher Ami's brave flight. In these difficult days, another legend was born. Corporal Alvin York of the 82nd, renowned for his sharpshooting prowess, after most of his accompanying troops fell under German machine gun fire. York remarkably eliminated 28 German soldiers, single-handedly forcing a larger battalion to surrender. His heroics that day led to him capturing 132 prisoners and later being awarded the Medal of Honor. Evidently, the battleground was too intensive. Despite the progress they were achieving, the Americans were suffering heavy losses with nearly 75,000 men falling since September 26th, exacerbated by a worldwide influenza epidemic that afflicted 70,000 more. The First Army was showing severe signs of weariness. Traffic jams clogged the supply routes, and the heavy losses meant inexperienced troops were sent to the front line. Even the usually unflappable General Pershing displayed distress, wrestling with personal grief, and mounting pressure from allies. Yet he didn't let things out of his control. Given the vast frontage, the burden of command became overwhelming for a single commander. Thus, Pershing divided the AEF into two, creating the Second Army and appointing General Robert Lee Bullard to lead it. The First Army fell under General Hunter Liggett's command, while Pershing assumed authority over a de facto army group. Consequently, a part of the First Army's front from port sur seille to fresnes on wouvre was transferred to the newly established Second Army. To address the manpower shortage, Pershing restructured the Basic Rifle Company, reducing its size from 250 to 175 men. Two divisions, the 84th and 86th, were cannibalized for replacements. On October 14th, the offensive resumed. Fresh regiments like the 42nd Rainbow Division, commanded by General Douglas MacArthur, were ushered in. The sights were set on the formidable Côte de Châtillon, near Montfaucon, the key bastion of the Kriemhilde Stellung line. On the night of October 13th and 14th, General Summerall, commander of the 5th Corps, paid a visit to MacArthur's headquarters. His words were chilling. Give me Châtillon, or a list of 5,000 casualties. The subsequent 48 hours witnessed a tumultuous battle. Displaying unwavering valor and seemingly indifferent to the hail of bullets and shrapnel, MacArthur led his men from the front. Their resilience bore fruit by the evening of the 16th when they secured the peak of Châtillon, successfully repelling an aggressive German counter-assault. Parallelly to everyone's astonishment, the exhausted 32nd Division managed to conquer the strategic Côte d'Am Marie breaching the Cremil de Stelling in another sector. This significant achievement, however, came at a staggering cost. 
It took the First Army three weeks and the tragic loss of 100,000 soldiers to realize an objective that General Pershing had optimistically set for day one. In its second phase, the Meuse-Argonne campaign, despite its grueling nature, yielded substantial gains for the American expeditionary forces. The offensive witnessed a rise in the number of German divisions committed to the fight and their entrenched positions, including the formidable Hindenburg Line, were breached. Also, the Argonne Forest, once considered nearly impassable, was now under American control. An advance of 21 kilometers had been achieved, and substantial enemy losses were inflicted. By late October, preparations were in place for the First Army to launch a decisive attack. Detailed instructions were issued for an assault scheduled on October 28th, which was postponed to November 1st, to ensure coordination with the 4th French Army on the left. The objective was clear. Capture key locations, including Buzancy, the heights of Baricourt, turn the forest north of Grand Pré, and establish contact with the 4th French Army near Boulto Bois. This marked a notable change, as the 1st Army was now operating under conditions familiar to them. The preparations were meticulous and, for the first time, primarily managed by American personnel. On the dawn of November 1st, a thunderous barrage set the stage for the renewed offensive. Three Army Corps took positions, with the Fifth Corps in the center, expected to play a pivotal role on the first day of the assault. Their advance was swift and decisive, with exceptional artillery support, allowing significant gains across several key locations. Meanwhile, under General Liggett's leadership, reforms were being made to the First Army's tactics. Liggett, ever practical, directed forces to avoid direct charges at machine guns and strong points. As the offensive progressed, the First and Third Corps on the flanks attacked with intensity. But it was Summerall's Fifth Corps, especially the Second Division with its Marine Brigade, that shattered the German defenses. This was complemented by ground-air coordination, a novel approach at that time, as the air service bombarded German positions. As days unfolded, German defenses crumbled consistently under American pressure. Their attempts to set up defense lines were continually thwarted. By November 3rd, the second division strategies had the Germans trapped and in disarray. Initially viewed as a potential barrier against the American advance, the Meuse River was breached on November 5th, when the 5th Division executed a daring river crossing at dun sur meuse The significance of this move was twofold. It broke the German hope of containment, and the crucial railroad was soon accessible to American artillery. In the backdrop of these military advancements, diplomatic channels were active. German officials met with the Allies on November 8th to discuss peace terms. However, General Pershing believed in pushing forward until a German unconditional surrender. He was overruled by political leaders, including President Woodrow Wilson. Pershing's ambitions then centered on Sedan, a city with historical significance for the French due to their defeat there in 1871. The city became the focal point of an interdivisional competition between the 42nd and the 1st Division, leading to a chaotic situation involving friendly fire incidents and the brief arrest of General Douglas MacArthur under suspicions of being a German spy. Despite the tumult, Pershing dismissed the concerns favoring the 1st Division. As November 11 dawned, the much-anticipated armistice was finally implemented at 11 a.m. However, many American 1st and 2nd Army's divisions remained in combat positions. Pershing's leadership on November 11th, the day the armistice was declared, was later questioned. He continued offensive actions even though he was aware of the impending ceasefire. This resulted in approximately 11,000 casualties on that day alone, more than the D-Day casualty count. Congress later reviewed this decision, with Pershing stating he was following orders from his superior, Ferdinand Foch. Congress did not place blame on any individual. Despite criticism of Pershing's approach, one element remained indisputable. His leadership played a significant role in the victory at the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Leading an inexperienced team, 
Pershing guided the American First Army against a seasoned and deeply entrenched enemy. Between September 26th and November 11th, troops under his command encountered 47 German divisions. The Allied forces caused 100,000 German casualties in that period and took 26,000 prisoners. They also secured 847 cannons, 3,000 machine guns, and other war materials. Pershing, ever the strategist, later remarked that given another 10 days, his men would have completely decimated the German army. However, the price they paid for this glorious victory was terrifying. In one and a half month of operations, the First Army had lost 117,000 soldiers, making the Meuse-Argonne offensive not just one of the bloodiest encounters of World War I, but one of the deadliest battles in the United States' entire military history. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to the Militology channel. Don't forget to click on the bell icon to be notified for our newest videos. Stand down for now, but be ready to jump back into the front lines with our next video.